the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us. If you would, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's go before the Lord in prayer together today. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, our King. Lord, we thank you for your presence already in this place, God. What an amazing time just praising you, lifting you up, worshiping at your feet, God. Thank you for those that have already been touched and healed and encouraged and blessed. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to keep going on further with you. Lord, we pray that as we approach your word and open it, that today, God, that you would open it up to us. Please give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, I pray that you give us the wisdom and the vision and the direction that we need so that we can go out of this place and reach a lost and dying world for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you, Lord, that you don't just bless us today, but also that you would bless all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them, Lord. We don't consider ourselves better than them, but we think of ourselves as workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. God, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor today. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, if you have your Bible today, and I hope you do, if you don't, start bringing your Bible to church, because that's what we're going to open up each and every time we come, and maybe you don't know where the books are, maybe you don't know where chapter and verse is, but hey, as you grow in the things of God, you're going to start learning, so get your Bibles, and uh, if you don't have it, we'll put it up on the overheads for you this week, but next week, start bringing your Bible to church and start getting a hold of the things of God. You can open up to the book of Jeremiah, and we're going to be in chapter number 31. We'll get there eventually, okay, because I've got an introduction, we've got to get through some things in order to get where we're going today. Today, we're talking about covenant. Talking about covenant. Lots of people have heard the word covenant before. Maybe they've seen the word covenant in the Bible, but they don't really have an understanding of what's going on when it comes to covenant. In fact, probably a lot of people in American churches have no clue and no concept about covenant when it comes to the Bible or when it comes to the things of God. So throughout the Bible, we encounter this word called covenant. In fact, uh, most of the modern translations call it Old Testament, New Testament. And some of your translations might even say Old Covenant and New Covenant. But this thing called covenant is central to our understanding of the Bible as well as our understanding of God. You and I need to know about covenant. Now, I'm going to put a statement up on the overhead for you so that you can see it and, and maybe write it down if you're taking some notes today. But... It'll help us to find out why this thing called covenant is important to our lives. Here's the statement. God relates, explains, and joins himself to us through covenant. Let me say that again. God relates, explains, and joins himself to us through covenant. So if we're going to relate with God, if we're going to have any sort of relationship with God, we've got to do it through covenant. If we're going to find out about God, or maybe we have questions about God, and we want to understand more about who he is and how he operates, what he does, what's his character like, we're going to have to find out that through covenant. And finally, if we're going to link up with God, if we're going to join up with God, then we've got to join up with him through this word called covenant. So today, with this understanding, let's move on. Let's move forward. What is this thing called covenant? How would we define covenant? If it's that central to our understanding and that central to our lives, God relates, explains, and joins himself to us through covenant, then what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is a binding agreement. It is the closest and most sacred of all contracts. A covenant is a binding agreement. It's the closest and most sacred of all contracts. You see it up there on the overheads for you if you want to write it down so that you can remember it. In today's world, we would say that covenant is like, uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of things. Maybe you've seen it. You've, you've been, uh, you know, you bought a car or something like that. And as you were, you know, signing that mile-long form and, and initialing here, there, and everywhere. And then at the bottom, you signed your name. You noticed that it said, you know, in some of this fine print that, that this is a covenant or this, this, this signature agrees to all the covenants and is binding, right? So, so we understand on a ba- very basic level, a covenant is, a, is like legal documents. How about this one? You, you went and bought a house, right? 
and, and, and they take you into that room during escrow and all that kind of stuff, and they break out just the brick O documents, right? And they lay it down in front of you, wham, right? And they, they set it down, and they say, okay, initial here, initial here, initial here, initial here, sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here, initial here, sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here, initial here, and, and prick your finger, write in blood on the bottom, sign there. Did that happen to anybody other than me? But we understand that, that a covenant is a binding agreement. You agreed for a certain thing, for a certain term, at a certain interest rate, and now you are bound by that covenant, and if you do not fulfill the obligation to pay, then they will take it away. But did you know that God, in his relation to us, and, and, and showing us about himself and revealing himself to us, went a, a step further. He leaves us an example on the earth that's probably the best example for you and I of what a covenant is. And that example is marriage. Maybe you didn't know marriage was a covenant, but think about it for a second. If, it, if a covenant is a binding agreement, the closest, most sacred of all contracts, then think about it in terms of marriage. You've got two parties, right? Two people. These two people come from two different backgrounds, two different families, maybe two different geographical locations and areas and cultures, and, 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 and maybe sometimes they, they've walked a different style of life, but then they meet up with one another. They start to get to know each other, start to understand each other, start to come together on some things, and then they realize that they're in love and they want to join their lives together. So they go through a covenant ceremony called a wedding. They invite friends and family to come and witness this thing. And there they stand before someone, a representative of God, and they make vows before God. They say, I will do these things. They start to list the terms of the covenant. I will love you for the rest of my life. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. I will be a husband or a wife to you. I will honor you. I will cherish you and they list out those terms of the covenant they make vows and they say i do to those things thus signing on the dotted line they exchange a gift called a ring give each other something that's precious and they put these rings on their fingers as a reminder to themselves yes but also as an outward expression that i am now in covenant with somebody so you don't have to wonder whether or not i'm married i'm wearing that symbol of the covenant now on my hand. Then after everything's all said and done and there's a pronouncement made, I now pronounce you husband and wife, right? They kiss and then they launch out and they do what? They celebrate. They have a party. They, all the friends and family are gathered together and they have a meal together. And at that meal they do something that's symbolic that now we are no longer two, but now we've been joined together as one. The Bible says what God has joined together, let no man separate, right? And they too shall become one flesh. So they symbolize that by taking a little piece of cake and they take that cake and they gently, lovingly feed it to their partner. No, they smash, right? Get over here. But really the symbolicism is that I am now in you and you are now in me. We are one together. Now everything's changed in their life. Now their, their, their life has now joined up as one. No longer are they so-and-so and so-and-so, but now they are Mrs. So-and-so and, -so and Mr. So-and-so, right? They, their names are now even joined as one. Their, their bank accounts are now joined as one. It's no longer yours and mine. No, now everything is ours. In fact, the Bible says your body's not even your own after you get married. You are now looking to please your partner. And so this is an example that God leaves for you and I about what a covenant is. It is the closest, most sacred of all contracts. It's a binding agreement. I believe that's why there's such an attack against marriages in our day and age is because the devil realizes that this is something that God has left us as a picture to relate and explain himself to us. And if the devil can distort it and tear marriages apart, then he can get people's eyes off of what that's a picture of, and that is God. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter number 5, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. What's he talking about? Well, that's in the context of he's talking about the marriage relationship. And he says that the man ought to love his wife, woman ought to respect her husband, and he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is a great mystery, yet I speak concerning Christ and the church. So we need to understand that this thing called covenant is really a deep understanding for you and I in order to relate understand, and join ourselves with God. Now at this point, you might be thinking, well, wait a second. 
Okay, I, I, I get all that. That's fine. I understand all that. Covenant, that's fine. But wh- why do I need to understand about Why do I need to know about covenant? What's that all about? Well, let me ask you something. Do you want to have a better prayer life? You'll get it through covenant. Do you want to have stronger finances than you ever had before? Well, of course, all of us do. We, uh, we all could say, yes, amen, I, I want stronger finances. Well, you're going to get that through covenant relationship with God. Do, do you want to have fulfillment in your life? Be blessed and walk in newness and authority? Well, you're going to get that through this covenant relationship. Do you want to experience the love and the power and the presence of God? Well, you can't do that unless you do that through covenant. And most people go through their lives and they never have an understanding and never even stop to figure out what's going on through covenant. God wants to speak to you today and build your prayer life, build your financial life, build the life of authority that you walk in, the blessing in the future, the destiny that he has for you. But you got to get it through this avenue of covenant. Are you listening today? So in order for us to have this understanding of who God is and how he operates, we must learn about his part in the covenant. To even get started, we got to find out what God's part in this whole thing called covenant is. A couple things today that we're going to take a look at. We'll make a statement. I'll finish it a couple times, and that is, our God is. Okay? Very simply, our God is. And we're going to find out, we're going to complete this statement and find out what is God's part in this whole thing called covenant so that we can operate in covenant and have a greater life than we ever had before. Number one thing today, our God is a covenant-making God. Our God is a covenant-making God. We need to understand that God is the one who initiates. God is the one who started it all. It was God who said, let there be light. It was God who said, now create the heavens and the earth. See, God is the one who created man. God is the one who set him in the garden. God is the one who gave him a job. God is the one who brought the woman. See, God is the initiator. The Bible says he is the author and the finisher. So God is the one who starts it. Our God is a covenant-making God. Sometimes we don't even know that God's making a covenant. In fact, in, in Jeremiah chapter number 33, he starts talking about if you can break my covenant with the sun and the moon, then you can break my covenant with David. See, God is the one who is making covenant, and we don't understand. When God said, let there be light, and let there be two lights to govern the night and the day, that is a covenant terminology. We thought God was just creating. No, God is making covenant, and therefore expresses and explains himself to us through covenant. Now, we don't go to God and say, I have something for you, God, to agree with me on. See, God's not involved in, in our thing. God's not interested in, I'm going to get involved in your thing. No, God comes to us and he says, I have something for you to agree with me on. And then we get involved in God's thing. You hearing that today? Our God is a covenant-making God. Salvation was his idea. Think on that for a second. Salvation was God's idea. We didn't even know we were headed for hell. We were so dumb. We were snorting, drinking, cussing, you know, going out and doing our own thing. And we had no clue. And it wasn't until God in his mercy sent somebody to tell us, hey, dummy. Wake up. You're headed down a path that's going to lead you to destruction. And you know it's true. All of a sudden, we got a revelation of who God is and what he'd done for us and, and, and how God had initiated something that could take care of the problem in our life, take care of the sin, take care of the hurt, take care of the pain, give us a future and a hope. Can't even get saved without God starting something in your life. We couldn't save ourselves. We were powerless. But God in his mercy stepped into time, stepped onto the planet in a, in a flesh suit, in a body. We just celebrated it at Christmas. Now, we can either accept or reject God's covenant, but we can't change it. We can either accept it or reject it, but you can't change it. You can't come to God and say, God, I like that salvation idea. That's, that's a pretty cool deal, but you know what? I don't like this whole faith and obedience. I don't like any of that stuff, God, so I'm going to do my thing and, and go to heaven. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. When you come to God, you come on God's covenant terms. That'd be like going to the bank and saying, hey, bank, you know, I want to buy this house and live in this house, but I don't want to pay. And they say, no pay, no stay. You get out of here, right? So you can either accept or reject, but you can't change. Why? Because God is the one who initiated it. God is the one who sets the terms. God is the one who says this is how it is. And then you either accept it 
and say yes, or you reject it, but you can't change it. Now, I had you turn to Jeremiah chapter number 31. And in Jeremiah chapter number 31, we're going to take a look at verse 31 and read through verse number 34 and see how many times in this passage as we read that God uses possessive words, okay? Talking about God is a covenant-making God. Jeremiah chapter number 31, verse number 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. So God is speaking right now. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now stop right there for a moment. Who's the one that's going to make the covenant? God is, right? God's the one that said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of of Judah. Verse number 32. Not according to the covenant that I made. Who made it? God. It's, come on. This is not, not hard stuff today. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Now stop. Hold on for a second. What is God talking about? Well, you remember when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he gave them what is called the law by Moses, also called the Mosaic Covenant. See, God was speaking in covenant terms, and he gave them this law. But they were powerless to keep this law, and so God says they are, they, they've got a problem. They, this, this may cover sin for a little while, but it doesn't take care of the issue completely. And therefore, instead of leaving us in that lost and fallen state, God says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, when I led them by hand, even though I was a husband to them. What is God doing? He's relating to us. See, we understand the responsibilities of a husband. We understand that husband and wife relationship. So now here's God saying, I'm relating to you. I, I'm showing you who I am through the avenue of this covenant. And I am the husband in this relationship. I'm the initiator. I'm the leader. I'm the one that you are to submit to in this marriage relationship. Therefore, in this covenant, you have not submitted and you've broken the covenant. And that's why I need to make a new covenant. Let's read on. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Notice all the possessive words that God is using right now. I, 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 me, my. God is saying, I am the initiator. I am a covenant making God. Verse 34, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. That's good news for you and I. Why? Because God took care of the sin issue. Now, just like that marriage, there's an exchange that takes place. Now God is on the inside of us and we are on the inside of God. And we can approach God now no longer in a fallen state. But now by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we approach God in a saintly state, in a perfected state. Now God has removed our sins. And the Bible says he's cast it as far as the east is from the west. Now we still live in these flesh bodies. We still mess up. And we still have a responsibility to repent and ask God for forgiveness. But as far as when it comes to our relationship with God, now we are in covenant relationship with God. And God has taken care of the sin in our life. So our God is, number one, he is a covenant-making God. Number two, our God is a covenant-keeping God. Now let me ask you something. What good would it be for God to make a covenant and then not keep it? Do you know the Bible says that God cannot lie? It's impossible for God to lie. That means that if God says he's going to do something, well, hey, you can stand on that. God's going to do it. If God says he's going to make a covenant and take care of the sin issue, well, we know that he did. We know that he sent Jesus. We know that Jesus was beaten. He was crucified. He died and he was raised again on the third day. So what happened? God said, I will do this. And then God did it. And now instead of looking forward to it, we're looking back on it and saying, God has kept every promise. Amen. See, in covenant relationship, it's a binding agreement. We take covenant way, way, way too, too casually in our day and age. We take it way too, you know... Just as a normal thing, oh, yeah, I'll agree to it, but then if I don't like it later on, I'll change. No, 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 no. 
That's not how this works. See, in, in covenant with God, you can accept or reject, but you can't change. And God is going to uphold his part no matter what we do. Why? Because if God doesn't uphold his part, then God's a liar and he's just lost his throne. Because he's now no longer qualified to be God. But God makes good on every promise he makes. And every word which he speaks, everything that he says he will do, he's going to do. Because he is God. Amen. Now, in tribal nations, if, if, if you study it out or you take a look at it, even in, in nations today that are, that are tribal, you'll notice that these tribes oftentimes will get into covenant with one another. And so let's say that, that we were a tribe, right, and, and we were living on the bank of a river, and on the other side of the river there was another tribe that was over there. The leader of our tribe decided, well, you know, we're going to get into covenant with that tribe over there, and we're going we're gonna to go over there, and we're going to, you know, link up in covenant. So you tribal leader goes over there and says, I want to make covenant with you guys. And they say, okay, we'll, we'll agree to the covenant. What are the terms? Well, you know what? Here's the terms. We're, we're going to be like one now. It's going to be no longer this tribe and that tribe. Now it's one tribe. And we are now, everything is yours is ours. Everything is ours is yours. Your enemies are our enemies. Our enemies are your enemies. Now we're in covenant together. So, you know, they, they do the, the whole covenant ceremony. There's exchanges that take place. They give gifts, right? They maybe even exchange blood where they, where they cut themselves and then they mingle the blood together. And now they are one together. They eat a covenant meal together. They plant a memorial so that anybody that takes a look would know that now these two tribes are now in covenant together as one. And the tribal leader leaves and goes back to their tribe. Now, on the surface, you take a look at that and you say, well, nothing really happened. But here we are on our side, they're over there on, our, on their side, and we didn't know that they had some enemies out there in the forest. And their enemies rise up and they come against them and they start to war against them. Now what happens at this point? Well, they would send a delegate over to our side and they would say, hey, our enemies have risen up against us, let's fight the battle together. Now because we were in covenant, we would have to uphold our part of the bargain, right? We would have to because it's binding. We said we're in covenant, we said we're one now, and now we would have to go and fight their battle. In the same way, let's say that on our side of the river, things started to dry up. We, we didn't have any crops, we didn't have any money to go buy crops, and so now we're starving and we're going through a tough time. We could send a delegate to the other side of the river there and we could say, hey, we need our provision, we need our resources, we need our crops, we need our money. And we need you to take care of us. And they would have to uphold their part of the bargain. Why? Because it's a binding agreement. They have to keep that covenant. Now, let's apply this to our relationship with God. Many times people don't understand that when they say yes to Jesus Christ and they become a Christian, that now, in the same way as there's a marital relationship that's one, now we are one with the Lord. God's on the inside of us and we're on the inside of God. There's been an exchange that has taken place by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we are in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is on the inside of us. And when God's enemies rise up, then we have to come against them. Why? Because that's God's enemy. And now we have to fight the battle because we're on the Lord's side. But you know what? When an enemy rises up against us, we can call on our covenant partner and say, Hey, God, come and fight this battle. How about this one? Every time we have an offering here at church, God says, Get out our checkbook. We have a need. Sometimes we say, oh God, I don't know if I can do this. But it's a binding agreement. We're in covenant. And when you walk out of this place and you go to the mailbox and you get out and you find the bills, you say, God, get out our checkbook. We have a need. See, God is bound by his word. And the Bible says, I will take care of all of your need according to my riches by Christ Jesus. See, see, it's a binding agreement. God will uphold his part of the bargain. You say, well, how do I do How You know, God's not going to break out a check. No, listen, you pray, you believe God, and then God will take care of it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Our God is a covenant-keeping God. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Turn there with me. Fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter number 7. And in Deuteronomy, Moses is preaching a message to the nation of Israel, he's talking to them and telling them about how God had brought them out of the land of Egypt, brought them out of slavery, about all the victories and the things that had been done, reminding them of some things. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to take a look at verse number 9, great verse. And look at what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 9. He says, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. 
the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Wow, what a great verse. Notice what he says. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God. See, there's no one else but him. There's no one like him. There's no one beside him. There's not a bunch of other gods out there. No, the Lord your God, he is God. But he's not just God somewhere off in the sweet by and by. No, he is the faithful God who keeps covenant. See, every word that God had spoken, he had taken care of. Everything that God had promised to the nation of Israel, he had done. And God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's you and I by faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God is, number one, he is a covenant-making God. Number two, he's a covenant-keeping God. Number three, our God is a covenant-revealing God. Our God is a covenant-revealing God. Now, God is not trying to hide from us. God is not trying to keep us in the dark. God's not trying to keep us stupid. God wants us to have an understanding of who he is and how he operates and the relationship that we have with him. But most Christians don't understand this thing called covenant, and so they're blinded to what's really available to them in this relationship with God. God wants to reveal himself to us, and he does it through covenant. That's why he gave us the marriage illustration. That's why he contains it in his word for you and I to read. And so God is saying, what good would it be for me to make a covenant and to keep a covenant, and then you have no idea about it? That'd be like if, if somebody that was a, a, a rich uncle or something like that had passed away and he said, you know what, I'm going to leave you an inheritance and I'm going to leave you millions of dollars and it's in a safety to deposit box in Switzerland. But he never sent you any message about it, never sent you the key, never gave you the access codes, never told you where the safety deposit box was or how to access it. What good would it do you? No good at all. And so you and I have to understand that God has promises. God has a great life ahead of us. God has plans for us. God has blessings that he wants to get to us. God has strength and provision. God, God wants to fight battles with you. God wants to do amazing things. And all of us would say, yes, amen, hallelujah. But how do we get to it? How do we get a hold of it? And God says it's through this covenant relationship that we have. Our God is a covenant revealing God. You're there in Deuteronomy. Turn Back in your Bible to the book of Psalm. I'm going to read a great verse in Psalms 25. Psalms 25, we're going to read verse number 14. Psalm 25, verse number 14 says this. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Notice that it's called a secret. A lot of times you'll, you'll hear our pastor say these words. He says it's called the hidden mysteries of God. Why? It's hidden because it's hard to find. It's a mystery because it's hard to figure out. See, there are things that a lot of people don't understand about God. And it's a secret to them. But the secret of the Lord is with somebody. Who's it with? Well, it's with those who fear him. What does that mean? That means that you are in awe and respect of God. That you tremble at his word. That you have such an appreciation of who God is. That you would do anything for him. You would do whatever he requires of you. Why? Because he's the stronger one in this covenant relationship. So the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Now take a look at the next part of this. And he will show them his what? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I only heard about five or six of you say that. He will show them his what? Covenant. Oh, that was about half of you guys. He will show them his what? Covenant. His covenant. See, God is not wanting to keep you in the dark. God doesn't want you blinded. No, God wants to reveal these things to you. And as you fear the Lord, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of understanding. You cannot know about God unless God starts to open things up to you. And as you come to God and you fear him and you are in awe of him and you respect him, then the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. God wants to bring light to your life. He wants to reveal these things to you. Three things we've learned already today. We've got one more, but we've already learned that, number one, our God is a covenant-making God. Number two, our God is a covenant-keeping God. You can stand on his word. Number three, our God is a covenant-revealing God. God doesn't want you blinded. God doesn't want you in the dark. Finally, number four, this is where you and I come in, and that is that our God is a covenant-enabling God. 
Remember, we had already said that we were powerless to save ourselves. And in fact, under the old covenant, under the law covenant, really it was just what the Bible calls a schoolmaster to show us that we were insufficient. But God said he was going to create a new covenant. And in order to explain himself to us so that when Jesus showed up on the scene and we would know who he was, he had to show us through the old covenant what to expect when he came. That's why there was a sacrificial system. That's why they would slaughter a lamb. That's why there was a day of atonement or a day where they took care of the sins of the nation. That, that's why there was a high priest all these things were the calling cards so that when Jesus showed up on the scene, John the Baptist would look up and say, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. See, what, what is he saying? He, he's saying, this is the one who the old covenant law was talking about. This is him. This is the Lamb. So they could get a picture. See, God relates, explains, and joins himself to us through covenant. God was relating himself to the children of Israel for centuries. So that when Messiah came, they would recognize who he was. And that sacrifice that was given would show them that now the sin is not just taken care of for a year. No, it is completely done away with. God is now taking care of the sin issue in our lives. But it's all through covenant. And now God doesn't just expect us to hold to rules and regulations. No, he expects us to have faith. And he now enables us to be a part of that covenant. We, we have a definition of that around this church called grace. Maybe you know what grace is. Say it with me. Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Right? But let's personalize it. When I. God's grace is his God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. See, God is a covenant enabling God. God will give us his grace. See, you can't even enter into the new covenant without the grace of God. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. See, God is saying something to you and I. He's saying you can't do this on your own. You're caught up in these fleshly bodies and, and these sinful suits, right? And, and you're going to mess up. You're going to fail. But by my grace, I now empower you and enable you to keep covenant with me. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13. Let's take a look at it together. Hebrews chapter 13. Last chapter in the book of Hebrews. It talks about this grace working in our lives. To enable us to keep covenant with God. And as we read, you'll notice it goes beyond just salvation. Salvation is the entry point. God is saying that's just the beginning. That's just the start. That's the birthplace. But as you grow up into the things of God, there are other things that God has for you. Like good works. God has great things ahead of you. God's got battles to fight. God's got victories to win. God's got a road to travel. God's got people to reach. God has plans and they aren't going to get accomplished in our own efforts and in our own strength. No, we need the grace of God. We need that enabling power of God to keep covenant. Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse number 20, and we'll read through verse number 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, sometimes we read a passage like this and we say, well, you know, he's just kind of concluding his remarks. In fact, some of your Bibles have titles on the top of them. They might say uh, the final farewell or farewell statements or benediction or any of that kind of stuff. But do you think that God is just saying goodbye? You think God is just wrapping up this book and just kind of saying, okay, well, we're done. And I don't want to just say the end, so I'll say, now may the God of peace. You know, no, God, God does not waste words. God is trying to speak something to us. God is trying to say something to us. And God is opening up our understanding. He's relating himself. He's, 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 he's revealing himself. He's explaining himself to us. He's joining himself to us through this covenant relationship. And so God is not just concluding some remarks in this book. No, he's saying something to you and I about our lives and about his enabling power to be in covenant with him. Let's take a look at it again, verse 20. Now may the God of peace. Notice that it says he's the God of peace. See, we didn't even realize before we got into covenant that we were at war with God. 
The Bible says that we were at enmity, we were at war, we were opposed to God, and we didn't even know it. We were just lost, just going about our own things, snorting stuff, drinking stuff, saying stuff, didn't realize what was going on. But the God of peace, who didn't want to be at war with you and I, who loved us so much, look at what he did, the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. See, God shed his blood through the great shepherd of the sheep, through Jesus Christ, the faithful one, the Messiah. Now he took care of the sin issue. He initiated it. He kept it. And now he reveals it to you and I so that he can enable us. Let's take a look at the enabling power in verse 21. Make you complete. Notice this is not you and I making ourselves complete. No, this is Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, who through the blood of the eternal covenant make you complete. See, the burden is on God. We can't perfect ourselves. We have to have faith and believe God and tap into the grace of God, that enabling power in our lives, so that it will make us complete. Let's read on. In every good work to do His will. See, this is not about our will. This is not about our wants or our desires. No, God is going to empower us and enable us. He's going to make us complete. Why? To do every good work according to His will. Working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Did he say you work what's well-pleasing? No, he says he works in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. See, I, I know the, the aim of my life when I think about what I want to do with my life. And when, when, when I encounter God, what do I want to see? Well, I want to see a smile on God's face. I want God to be happy with my life. I want God to be pleased and at the end of my life, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But listen, that doesn't come because I'm so cool, because I'm so nice, I'm awesome, I'm educated, I'm all this and that. No, that comes because Jesus Christ is working in me. That's why the Apostle Paul said in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, you and I, as we make this exchange, we give God our filthy, dirty, messed up, tore up life. Broke down, busted, and disgusted. And now God gives us the life of God. God gives us Jesus Christ. God gives us the perfect, complete, empowered life to live for him. And when God gets on the inside of you and starts to work through you and you yield yourself to him in this covenant relationship, it starts to work out his will and what's well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What have we learned today? So far we've learned that God relates, explains, joins himself to us through covenant. We learned that a covenant is a binding agreement. It's the closest, most sacred and of all contracts. We learned that our God is a covenant-making God. God initiates. God starts things. God, God gets things going. He makes covenant with you and I. We learned that God is a covenant-keeping God, that he doesn't just make them and not keep them. No, God can't lie. You can take his word and stand on it because he is a covenant-keeping God. We learn that God doesn't want us stupid. He doesn't want us blind. And so our God is a covenant-revealing God. God wants to open up to you and I this great relationship through covenant. He wants to show us who he is. And finally, we learn that our God is a covenant-enabling God, that God will allow you and I the grace and the strength to partake of this great covenant. Now it's no longer about our works getting to God. No, it's about God getting to us and empowering us and enabling us to keep this covenant. One last verse that you guys get because you didn't get up and leave right now. Everybody else misses out on the good stuff. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 15. In the Good News translation, I like the way it says it in the Good News translation. First Chronicles 16, 15 says, Never forget God's covenant which he made to last forever. Come on, that's good news. That's good news. Never forget God's covenant, which he made to last forever. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to ask you a question. How many of you guys liked that message today? Just give me a, a show of hands. You liked the message. All right. Now... Now, I'm not asking that because I'm insecure and needing to know that, you know, you like me or anything like that. The reason why I'm asking is because that message that I preach today is just a little teeny tiny piece of the introduction of the class that I teach in our Bible college on blood covenant. 
So if you like that message today and you want to learn more about it, then you need to go sign up for our Bible college. Because in the fall semester for the first year students, I'm going to be teaching on covenant and you're going to get a deeper understanding and your life will be changed. You're also going to learn about the Holy Spirit, healing. You're going to learn about New Testament, Old Testament. I mean, there are just so many things. Prayer, worship, the heart of God. I mean, there are so many things that you're going to find out in our Bible college. And so you need to get back there and you need to sign up for that. I also want to mention to you water baptism next week. If you haven't been water baptized, then stop messing around with God. Get water baptized. Jesus did it, and so we need to follow his example and do it too. And that's next weekend, right after this service and right after the third service or Saturday after the Sabbath service. So make sure to do that. Hey, you guys have been great today. We've had a great time in the Word of God, great time in the praise and worship. I mean, we were jumping up and down, clapping, shouting, singing. My goodness, we've had a great experience with God today. But it'd be a tragedy if we had such a great time with God, and then we walked out of this place, your heart was not right with God, you died and went to hell. And today, I, I love you enough to, to talk to you and take a moment and tell you the truth, not play games. God loves you so much. He sent Jesus and was beaten, bloody, crucified, hung on a cross, died, was raised again to life so, so that you and I could be with him. Don't you think that this covenant-making God, this covenant-revealing God would want to reveal to you and I how to get to heaven if he wanted us to be with him? Well, he does in his word. He doesn't just leave it up to you or me or some well-meaning church committee. Not all roads lead to God. We've got to get there one way. And Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So it's God's heaven, and we got to get there God's way. So what makes you think you're going to heaven? Just answer that question in your heart. Just take a moment. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you've been good? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does God say you can be good enough? In fact, we talked about that today. We can't get to God in our own efforts. Nor in the Bible say you can be good enough. The standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to make it just by being good. Can't make it to heaven by being good. There's nowhere in the Bible says how good you have to be or you have to be good enough or be above this line. There's no grading scale, no curve in order to be good enough to get into heaven. You're not going to make it if you think that you're going to get to heaven just by being good. Come on, let's talk today. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Is, be, is it because you were raised in church? Parents took you to church, told you you're a Christian, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck? Had you baptized or christened as a child? Maybe because they took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class or Sabbath school class. You were born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church as a child, parents take you to church and call you a Christian, go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're born in America or because you're not some other religion that that qualifies you being a Christian headed for heaven. It doesn't work like that. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Well, sometimes people say, well, not only when I was, when I was a child did I go to church, but here I'm in church right now today, sitting right in front of you, Pastor. Uh, you are, that's great, and I, I'm very glad that you're here, but could you show that to me in the Bible where church attendance gets you into heaven? Where you sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Any more than you go sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Come on, you're just a person sitting in your garage. So you can't just sit in church and call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. What well, makes you think you're going to get into heaven? Sometimes people would say, well, not only have I attended church, my last church I got involved. I sang in the choir, helped out, carried the bastard Bible. I made decisions in that church, and people thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Could, could, could you show that to me in the Bible where it says you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir, people think of you as a leader, you teach in the Bible class, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's looking for a membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. That's how you think you're going to make it. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth today. You're not going to make it. Come on, what makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I know God. I, I know about God, I know about Jesus. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life and celebrate the resurrection at Easter. I could, I could quote scriptures and tell you Bible stories. I know God. 
That's great. Once again, glad you can do those things. But have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself can quote scripture, knows who Jesus is, but he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who he is, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. He wants your heart. Jesus said it like this. He was speaking to a religious leader of his day who we would have thought was cool with God. We would have thought he was headed for heaven, but he doesn't say that he was going to heaven. No, he says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, but this is not about what society says. Rather, this is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with God. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together when I say three. Just like this. One, two, three. And pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands pop together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. But get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off for a second. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. So come on today. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Wow, that's what we want. But he says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. I've done my job. God's already done his job. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Now, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You've never done this. Never given God all your heart. Never given God all your life. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on today, make sure. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place today. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or online, you can raise your hand right afterwards and we'll let you know what to do. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Let's do it all together on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Seven, eight, got you up on top. Eight, nine, thank you. There's 10 up on top. There's 11, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? There's 12, thank you. God bless you. On this side, anybody else real quick? 12, up on top. Just wave it at me a little bit. How many of them? Okay, there's a bunch of you guys. 12, 13, 14, 15, thank you. God bless you guys. Anybody else real quick? 16, got you right there. 16 wise people already. Anybody else real quick? 16. 16 wise people. Where are you at, number 17? You're sitting there wondering if you should. You should. Come on, go for it. Anybody else real quick? 17, 18, thank you. 19, 20, thank you. Anybody else real quick? You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. If that's you, just pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Come on. It's 20 wise people already. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should do this. Come on, go for it. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? 21. Where are you at? Number 22. Anybody else? Come on. Let's just go for God today. Just lift your hand real quick and acknowledge I want to be born again. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a hand for 21 wise people. Hallelujah.
All right, real quick, all 21 of you, or if you're number 22, number 23, number 24, or number 25, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, listen, you still haven't missed out. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get your stuff, basically. Get in the aisle, and I want you to meet me up front. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout, and that's your cue. If you raised your hand or you should have, to just get your things. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. You come. You come. Lord, I give you my heart. Hallelujah, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come give too. You my soul. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. And you just make your way forward right now. For you alone. Every breath that I take. They're still coming. Come on. There's room for you. You can come right now. Just make your way to the front. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids, just bring your kids right now. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, well, they're still coming, come on. You can come too, this is your time, this is your moment of salvation. All right, come on, let's let them come. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Come on, you can come. Hallelujah. Hey, everybody up front, look up at me for a second. Put a smile on your face, all right? This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart. You came to give God all of your life. You're going to be born again. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy? This is Pastor Dave waving his hands at you. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, all right? Brand new from the inside. But now you need to learn how to live your life for Jesus, okay? So the second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Easy reading, and I encourage you, you need to find out what to do next. So read through that basic information. And then the third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free what we call an SPT. Now what is that? That's a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's a friend in church who will come alongside you and encourage you and build your walk with God. He'll describe how it works. It's free. Now, listen, you said, not me, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Now, let us help you to do that. And SPT is a friend in church who will help you to find out what to do next and will encourage you and strengthen you in your walk with God. If you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 